So Andrea, um, Andrea, I, I'm sorry, I sort of lost track of what you were saying before. Usually I see the chat, right? Will the chat be obvious to me? Yeah, it should be obvious to you at the bottom of your screen. Do you see a little box? No, now I, yeah, now I just opened it up. Yes. Yeah. So I guess I can field questions through that, right? Yep. Now, what did you say about giving a summary? I didn't understand what you were asking that I do at the end of the talk. Oh, no, you don't need to give a summary. I, I think just a, um, Alan, if you can, if you remember, just to mention that we are, will hold a re research retreat in the fall. Okay. I, I didn't create a, a final slide for that because Roger and I haven't had a chance to go over any specifics on it. So I, I didn't want to advertise something that we hadn't yet figured out. So I would just make note of it um, and that there will be more information coming on it. And you'll be disseminating that to the whole mailing list? Yes, way. exactly, yes. Okay, all right, I'll try to remember that. And if I don't, just interrupt me, I don't mind. Okay, <laughs> that, I can do that too. Andrew, I think we're good. Everything looks okay. I think you should be seeing the slide now. Yep, I see it. Does it come up all right? Yep. Okay, great. And I'm going to go ahead and get Wirecast started uh, just prematurely, uh, only because I might have to step away for a few minutes, but everything is running uh, fine. Uh, okay, I, I just, because you are the host. I'm going to give it back to you. I'm going to give it back to you. Perfect, um, okay. Yeah, right after I get Wirecast up, I'm going to send that right back to you. And then everybody should be fine going forward. And you should be able just to knock my slide right off by sharing screen uh, instantly. So By just, my sharing this. Oh, by Vadim yes. sharing the screen. Yeah, the second okay. he shares, that'll kick the slide off. Perfect. As long as he has co-host privileges, um, yep. he shouldn't have any problem doing that. And then I'm going to just make sure. Andrew, this is our last seminar, right? For the year. It is. One more. Right. Correct. This is the last for the spring semester. Okay. That looks good. And then just take another moment here. Andrew, you should be the host again. Yep. Okay, great. And then let me just double check the recording. Yeah. Andrew, for the questions, will everybody be able to ask the question right from their own computer? We don't need to give people permissions, do we? Correct. They can type in their questions. They do not have microphone access. Uh huh. Should so there won't be. What about should, should, should we give people just microphone access instead? Or well, sometimes that uh, it creates just a whole bunch of um, you know speakers in the background. So okay. it's probably better for you to just um, you know read the questions, moderating them. Okay. okay, I'll do that. I made you co-host just in case you need it. Okay. As well. Okay, I'm recording the backup with Wirecast. We're broadcasting fine on YouTube. And I'm gonna hang out just until we start. Then I'm gonna go, I might be quiet for a bit, but Andrea, you can um, just text me if there's any issue. Sure, sure. I'll be, I'll be able to jump on very quickly. I just had something sort of collide with this <laughs> at the sure. same time, I apologize. Oh, we're up and running, we're good. Okay, thanks, George. You're very welcome.
So Vadim, are you having the Glenn Symposium this year there? Are you doing the Glenn? Are you having the Glenn Symposium on aging? They usually I, have. I think I think there is a symposium because uh, I'm not uh, an organizer. It's David Sinclair who organizes it. I think there is one. Um, I just don't remember for sure. I need to, to look in my schedule. Okay. There are so many meetings. <laughs> yeah. Are you going in person these days? Uh, yeah, I've, I've been at a few conferences recently, and uh, this summer quite yeah. Many actually. Yeah. There will be in person conferences. Well, I guess it'll be great if we all return from our conferences without getting sick, you know. <laughs> How about you? Have you traveled? I did one in California, and, and next week I do one in Denver, and then a long one in Israel. Um, and then I, I'm going to try to stay home and just uh, recover. <laughs> but, yeah. How big is your group now, Vadim? Currently, I think we have uh, 11 people in oh, the group. Nice. Good size group. Yeah. Yeah. And from looking at, at you, I see you have a nice view out your window. Yeah, we are kind of in the center of the yeah. uh, Longwood medical area. Yeah. What, what floor are you on in the new research building? Uh, I'm on the fourth floor. Uh -huh. Yeah, so what you see behind me is a children's the parking lot, right? Children's hospital. There is all this right. links with blood, with slabs. Yeah, it's amazing since I was in the area there how how built and rebuilt it has become. Fantastic. It's actually quite nice. There are so many good people here. <laughs> yeah. 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 Terrific. Okay, I'm going to start in a couple of minutes, um, Alan. The there are about 125 um, registrants. Oh, great! So sometimes when the when the webinar starts, just wait a couple of minutes because it takes a, a couple of you know a couple of minutes for these people to to get. So on, on my on my screen, it says four at this point. Yes, is that because I'm not seeing what you see? Yep, there's four of us that are actually on. The webinar currently is myself, you, Vadim, and George. Uh -huh. And slowly, that number is going to start to populate as I start the webinar. Now, do I have You'll to see. do I have to click start webinar, or are you doing that? I'm gonna I'm gonna start it right in one minute. Okay. <laughs> so you don't have to touch it. Okay. Vadim, do you do anything with diet? Oh, well, I'm not. <laughs> okay, I have a dog barking in the background. So I'm going to mute myself and I'm going to start it. Does yeah, that so sound okay, Alan? Yeah, so when should I start the introduction? I'd say um, just just wait until that that number add, rises to like twenty five or thirty, and then okay. you can start. Okay. For those of you online, we're just standing by for a moment to let the electronics catch up with us. So hello, my name is Alan Taylor, and I'm the director of the Lab for Nutrition and Vision Research at Tufts University. It's our distinct pleasure today to have with us Dr. Vadim uh, Gladyshev. Um, Dr. Gladyshev got his degrees, his BS and his MS and his PhD in Russia. Um, he was then a fellow in Bethesda, and he had an intervening position before assuming his current position now, which is professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. 
Dr. Gladyshev received multiple awards, including the NIH Directors and Pioneer Eureka Merit Awards. He's recently been nominated or elected to the National Academy of Sciences. So his career has been on a meteoric rise. And I think we're gonna have a seminar of that kind of quality that we anticipate with all this recognition. His laboratory um, studies mechanisms of aging, lifespan, control, and rejuvenation, as well as the fundamental biology of aging and the relationship between aging and age-related diseases. Um, they've collected large data sets on gene expression and metabolite levels across mammals, flies, yeast, and sequenced and analyzed genomes of many long-lived species which I'm sure we'll hear some about today. They've developed signatures of longevity. And I think with all of that as background, um, we probably shouldn't delay too long because it seems like he's got a lot to talk about. And um, I'd like to mention though, that he's a guest in our um, biology of aging class at Tufts. Um, and we will hold a research retreat for the healthy aging group in the fall. People who are on this mailing list will be notified about that retreat. And in order to ask questions, if you would, please use the chat function so I can try see them. I am pinch hitting for other people who are supposed to be coordinating. So I wanna be sure that I do my best to try to see all the comments. So if you use the chat, I'll be able to see them. Thank you. And with this, I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Gladyshev. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Arin, for the kind introduction. And I really appreciate the invitation. And been honored to, to, to be here to, in your program and, and present a little bit about our research. So thank you very much. Let me share my screen. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I will tell uh, a little bit about, uh, yeah, about aging and rejuvenation and particularly from the omics and kind of quantitative perspective on these processes. So uh, in this group, of course, there is no need to, to say that, um, uh, that diseases are increased with age. So when, when a person is young, there is almost no diseases. But when somebody is old, let's say 80, 80 years old, typically there are many age-related diseases. So of course, uh, age emerges as the main risk factor for, for these diseases. But then the question that we really need to ask, actually, what is aging? Uh, and the reason that we need to ask that question is that even people in the field, they understand aging in, in different ways. So some people think that aging is age related changes, or some people think about increased mortality rate with age, some decreased fitness or functional decline. Uh, some people think it's a continuation of development or increased biological age or damage accumulation. Of course, later in life, all of these features, they apply to the aging process, but there are some other periods of life when they, they're quite uh, diverged. So if we study aging and try to kind of target it, we need to understand who is our enemy. Like of all of these features of the, of the aging process, what is actually aging? And there's completely no consensus in the field. So I think many people think that they understand. Uh, we all think, you know, personally we understand what aging is, but, but somehow that understanding is different uh, across different people. So uh, to me, it's an important question to really try to figure out what is aging specifically, and then uh, use that kind of model to, to develop a research program around it. So, uh, I told you that there's no consensus and there are all kinds of different theories uh, of aging and they, they all have some merit, but uh, you know, they are, they are different and there's no consensus and, and it seems many theories are incomplete. So I'll just instead just tell you kind of how I think about the aging process and then uh, try to illustrate how we use this understanding uh, to, to address the various questions in the aging field. So to me, the most important feature of aging is damage. Uh, damage kind of in a broader sense. I will expel, explain to you in, in a minute. And I find that an easy way to explain is utilizing this uh, kind of example. So let's consider an enzyme that converts a substrate to a product. So this enzyme is encoded by a gene, presumably a evolutionary conserved gene, and that gene is needed to support that particular function. 
So our life is composed of functions, yeah? And, you know, 20,000 genes, for example, in the human genome, each gene has a particular function. But when this function is used, let's say this enzyme is used, then there is non-zero likelihood that this enzyme produces something else. Let's call it damage. And uh, this could be something which reacts with the, uh, with the enzyme, that enzyme catalyzes the reaction of some other substrate or maybe an unwanted substrate producing some kind of unwanted consequence, some kind of molecule. Uh, or sometimes it actually the, could be the original substrate, but again, the product could be, could be, could be different. There is a non-zero likelihood because you know, nothing in biology is perfect. En enzymes are composed of only 20 types of amino acids. And, you know, it doesn't matter how well the active site is built, it, it's never perfect, yeah? So, and if we expand this concept to all other features of biology, we can say that damage would come in many flavors. So it could be in the form of byproducts of reactions or mutations or genetic uh, drift, for example. Uh, there could be uh, errors in transcription translation. It could be such examples of like imbalance in protein complexes or imbalance in tissues, in, 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 uh, in, in balance of cells in tissues. There could be many other known and unknown forms of damage. In the lab, uh, we uh, sometimes call it cumulative damage, but we also call it the deleterial. Uh, the reason for it is that, uh, to me, aging is not just kind of byproducts, not just molecular damage. It's really a negative consequence of being alive, negative age-related changes. It could be some alteration of uh, an expression of a particular gene or altered level of a hormone, for example, in the blood. They all would be, would be aging. This also means that literally every serial of function contributes to damage, damage accumulation, contributes to aging. And then there could be none uh, damage forms which would be the most important. So it's not it's not telomeres and, and not, I don't know, mitochondria, and it's not proteostasis, not autophagy, not DNA damage. You know, it, it's all this together. And that makes it really difficult to, to design, even design experiments to try to address that. So another point I'd like to make is damage is largely non-random. Sometimes it's discussed like stochastic damage, a kind of random damage. Of course, there are some random damage, but uh, this particular damage here, for example, in this particular example, it's not just any damage. It's a very concrete, specific damage produced by this enzyme. This enzyme would react in a, you know, in a preferential manner with its substrates and other uh, molecules to produce specific damage at a specific rate. Therefore, damage or, or, or generation of damage, in a way, is, is kind of programmed in the genome. I'm not, it's not to say that uh, aging is programmed. Aging, in my mind, is not programmed. What is programmed is biology. But because damage is a consequence of that biology, damage appears as like a, a, like a quasi-programmed, in a way. Yeah? So it's largely non-random. And that, that therefore, it, 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 genetics is, is, is the main feature that defines aging. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, another point is that this idea of antagonistic polyotropy is a really a main or oh, very important uh, evolutionary idea, evolutionary theory of aging. But the point is here, if you look at this scheme, this antagonistic uh, polyotropy already emerges here because this is would be the positive function in the antagonistic polyotropy kind of theory. And this would be negative, except it's not like negative, which only emerges later in life. It's cumulative. It accumulates over time and therefore becomes negative. Whereas the positive function uh, that it's kind of constant across lifespan. So therefore, it, antagonistic pleiotropy cannot really emerge because it's inherent in life. Every cellular function, every gene already from the very beginning has the, uh, the kind of built-in property of antagonistic pleiotropy. So in my mind, antagonistic pleiotropy cannot really explain aging from that perspective. Uh, uh, you know, in organisms which don't age, <laughs> antagonistic pleiotropy is still there. Anyway, so I told you that uh, damage is really widespread. It, it's, it's everywhere kind of as a consequence of biology. Then you may ask, you know, how come some organisms do not age? For example, if uh, some, some simple prokaryote that symmetrically divides, uh, aging is not really applicable to, to, that, or to that organism. So this is what I think. I think that uh, damage can be 
<clears throat> because so many diversity of forms of damage, it cannot be fully cleared, but it can be diluted. Um, and uh, this is illustrated here. So let's say this is a cell and it has uh, some cellular components and, and two damages, like one and two. And then cell grows and, and two becomes four. And when this cell divides, uh, it distributes the damage into two cells. And there are now two here and two here and then four again. And so as long as the rate of damage accumulation is not higher than damage dilution, the cell does not need to know on its sense or remove that damage. It would simply be there. So the strategy of life then is to repair some damage. That's why we have many protective systems uh, inside the cells and, and also protective uh, systems at the organism level, like you know, kidney, for example, or lymphatic system, and so on. But then the rest, uh, you know, we can take care of some damage with these protective systems, but then dilute or asymmetrically distribute the rest. And therefore, even the kind of net, the network of damage could be broader and more extensive than the network of life. Uh, we could still kind of sustain life. And this is probably, um, this idea probably was important from the very beginning of life, from the very first proto-cells. They already had to deal with that issue of damage accumulation. And therefore, cell division is probably an essential element of life, not just uh, because the life needs to be refereed and kind of uh, be involved in uh, natural selection, but also to dilute this damage that generates uh, as, as a, as a, during life itself. So, however, if dilution is not possible, for example, if we have non-renewable cells and structures, like an eye, so, or a skeleton, or you know, cardiomyocyte neurons, that's it. Aging is unavoidable. So, and, and this, this, of course, applies to mammals. Uh, so aging, uh, I don't think we can really stop aging in mammals for that, for that, on, for that reason. But of course, there are, we, we, could, we, could, we could still target it. We could slow down and, and maybe reverse age in some ways. So now with this kind of understanding of, of aging, uh, you know, which of course I, I fully admit it may, may not be correct. It's kind of our thinking about it, but you know, there could be other, other models, of course. We, we develop various uh, projects. And as I mentioned about genetics, and uh, so we initially started with looking at the genomes of exceptionally long-lived mammals. And over the years, we sequenced uh, many, many such genomes, many, many organisms. The first paper actually here was already published 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. It's, it's the, the first genome of the naked mole rat. And as far as I know, this was the first genome sequenced with the whole purpose of understanding exceptional longevity. And then later on, we sequenced this organism called Brand's bat. It's a very interesting organism because it's one of the smallest mammals, weighs only five to seven grams, but lives more than 40 years. Uh, of course, the bowhead whale, which is the longest lived mammal known. This is the, the Maryland mole rat. And more recently, we, we've done the beaver and, and, and various other organisms as well. So what we learned from this is that nature uh, has unique, uh, has developed unique features to sustain long life in the organisms. So some adaptations to long life in the naked mole rat, for example, are not the same as in the brand's bed. But at the same time, there are also common features across the organisms. Therefore, in addition to looking at exceptionally long-lived mammals, we also look across mammals. And for that, we um, analyze them at the genomic level, at the various omics levels, and develop, develop what, what we call longevity signatures. And these longevity signatures can be, can be of, of several types that we, that we develop. The first one we call evolutionary signature, which is across mammals. And for that one, we, as of now, we analyzed 41 species of mammals. Uh, uh, this part is still unpublished and which differ more than 30 fold in lifespan. And we developed such signatures based on the transcriptomes in particular in, in the liver, kidney and brain. Another type of signature, signature across interventions. And we've done primarily this in mice. And for example, in this study, we collected 17 uh, interventions, which are kind of robust interventions to extend lifespan, such as calorie restriction, or rapamycin, uh, acarbose, and so on. And uh, try to understand common features of these interventions, common also diverse features of how they kind of remodel uh, the tissue in order for the tissue to, to live longer. 
And uh, this would be a different type of uh, signature. And the third type of signature is the signature across cell types because uh, you know organisms composed of different cell types and these cell types live uh, uh, different lives. Some cells like neurons or cardiomyocytes, they can stay for the whole life more or less. And some cells like cells in the blood, they are short lived. Okay. And so we could also uh, understand uh, this difference in lifespan across cell types within the same organism. And then we could try to utilize the signatures uh, for understanding uh, mechanisms by which lifespan can be extended. And I, again, I would stress that these mechanisms, some of them may be the same and some may be different. So in this study already published a few years ago, we, for example, analyzed 33 species of mammals at the level of the transcriptome. And you can see that uh, we could, we could, these are some of the species that we analyzed and they differ uh, in the various life history traits like maximal lifespan, this is in log scale, uh, type to maturity and various other uh, life history traits. And what have we learned from it? So if we uh, analyze the transcriptome, we find uh, I don't know, 500 to 1,000 genes in each uh, tissue that kind of define the, this longevity signature. And out of this kind of big uh, uh, data set, I'm only showing a, a small subset. And uh, the way it's organized, it's organized across the liver, brain, and kidney, three tissues, and uh, various life history traits like winning time, time to maturity, gestation period, and maximum lifespan. And also instead of genes, I'm showing pathways. Uh, here is the pathways. Uh, and blue here is down regulation and red is up regulation. So what we observe is that uh, like central metabolism is down regulated at the level of gene expression uh, in the liver uh, across mammals in order for those mammals to live longer. At the same time, these same genes are almost unaffected in the brain. And uh, I mean, they affect us a little bit, but not as much. And in the kidney, it's somewhere in between. There are other uh, uh, clusters which are specifically regulated in the brain, and there are some clusters which are regulated uh, at the level of all three tissues, which is upregulated. These are processes like repair, maintenance, and other processes. So the picture that emerges from this is that it's not only that we need to regulate certain genes uh, uh, in order to, uh, to, to, to remodel organisms for a longer life, but we need to do it in a tissue specific manner. So this would not be easy, easily recapitulated by, for example, simple manipulations, like you know, individual compound or maybe uh, some uh, knockout or some kind of expression of a gene, this would be different. So it will be very hard to recapitulate this process. However, it tells us that we have a particular direction. So if we can shift an organism in the direction of that longevity signature, perhaps it could lead to longer life. So now, uh, uh, so another example here. So in, in this study, we analyzed signatures across interventions. I already mentioned to you a little bit about interventions. And here it's uh, organized in the form of aggregated sperm correlation uh, uh, coefficient. Uh, and red means, you know, these interventions, they modify the organism or the tissue, the liver in this case, in a similar way and blue kind of in a negative way. And you immediately see that many interventions shown here form a cluster. So they uh, remodel the organism at the level of transcriptome uh, in, in a similar way. For example, calorie restriction here is a, you know, maybe one of probably the best known in, uh, longevity intervention. But then methylene restriction is quite similar. Every other day feeding as well, or FGF21 overexpression or, or several genetic models like shown here, they kind of remodel organism liver in this particular case in a similar way. But then there are some other interventions like rapamycin, which is also a well-known intervention, actually looks quite different at the level of gene expression. Of course, there are some genes which are commonly regulated by all of these interventions as well. Very few, I would say. But at the level of the entire transcriptome, rapamycin looks quite different from calorie restriction. And, and other interventions like semic deficiency also extends lifespan but also looks quite different. So what this means to us is that even though there are many interventions that behave in a similar way, actually there are kind of many routes to longevity. There, there are many ways to remodel the organism for that organism to live longer, basically. 
And that's why it's not really surprising that many screening uh, uh, data sets or, or studies, like for example, in C. elegans or in yeast or in, in flies, resulted in, in many actually interventions that, or, or gene manipulations that extend longevity. So it's not really that difficult actually to, to find uh, an intervention that extends, extends lifespan. Because again, so there are many ways to remodel the organism. And sometimes there is certain remodeling that, that kind of makes an organism, makes a tissue or cells that, that, that can uh, stay longer, live longer. Now, we could use these signatures to identify new interventions. So for example, here, these are signatures, some of the signatures, uh, longevity signatures that we developed. And then we look in the public data and we find that, uh, you know, for example, keep one knockout. Uh, results in the in the gene expression that is very similar to many signatures. So this could be a good candidate for lifespan extension. Or another candidate could be hypoxia, mild hypoxia could be uh, also another good example. Uh, there are some examples of interventions that would be predicted to shorten lifespan. And we also have done this screen in the in the CMAP database uh, with our signatures and found some interventions which are good candidates uh, uh, for for lifespan extension, they are shown here. Uh, and we tested some of them, and currently we have a large program to test many other interventions uh, for lifespan extension. And it, it, so far, it's actually looking very good in terms of the uh, prediction power of this approach. Another interesting observation that, that we found is that many of the interventions, they feminize animals. Uh, what I mean by this is that if we uh, compare gene expression between males and females, and then relate inter gene expression in response to interventions, they kind of move in the same direction. So like growth hormone receptor knockout, and snail dwarf, and methylene restriction, calorie restriction. Calorie restriction, for example, it kind of feminizes both males and females. Uh, but again, so there are some exceptions, like rapamycin, it's not. Uh, maybe a, a prote well, no, protein is kind of uh, a little bit, uh, interesting pattern, kind of uh, sex-specific pattern. But anyway, so there are some interventions, the majority they feminize, but not all. For example, rapamycin does not feminize and still extends lifespan. So it's not a universal feature, it's just a common feature of longevity inter interventions, but not really universal. Now, to test these interventions, uh, in addition to longevity signatures, we need a completely different tool. We need to quantify progression through aging because longevity, uh, longevity signatures, what they do, they uh, report the potential to live long. But if we use them to identify interventions and then testing interventions, we also need a tool that would uh, kind of um, assess the biological age of the organism, which longevity signatures cannot. And so for this, of course, we need biomarkers or so-called clocks. And of course, everybody knows that now there's a, it's a huge expansion in the field, it's particularly in the case of epigenetic clocks, initially conceived by Steve Horvath. And perhaps this is the most famous, uh, his paper uh, on multi-tissue Horvath clock, but then later uh, all kinds of different clocks like PhenoH or GrimH, uh, this Dunedin uh, clock and, and, and so on. Many other clocks, of course, have been developed, which have been really revolutionary in the field. Uh, because so many questions are now can be addressed. Of course, these clocks are not perfect and we still don't understand what they, exactly they measure, but the point is that they are much better than anything else that we had before, because simply we, pre we previously could not address a question like in, in a very straightforward and simple way uh, in assessing biological age. Uh, these clocks, uh, of course, are very approximate. They're kind of proxy uh, uh, to, to in assessing that age, but again, so it's better than what we had before. In my lab, we primarily focused uh, on the mouse. So we developed a, a few clocks, uh, genetic clocks that work in the mice. And also there are, of course, other labs contributed a lot to this. So the papers in blue are the papers from my lab where we developed various uh, uh, clocks, epigenetic clocks. And I will tell you a little bit about some of these clocks uh, today, later. I would just mention that in addition to uh, epigenetic clocks, there are many other ways to quantify aging. And so these are again papers from our lab where we would, uh, for example, develop a clock based on the, on the damage in the transcriptome, or for example, on, on the, based on the composition of trace elements and, and so on.
the point here is that aging can be quantified by various features. It's just a pigeon clock for some reason is uh, is more accurate, uh, but obviously not not the only way to quantify the aging process. So just tell you very briefly how we how we develop the clocks, um, and we use at least initially we used a very standard or Horvath kind of approach. So in the case of mouse, we collected the blood of black six mice. Uh, for the first clock, we used 141 animals, uh, 16 age groups from three to 35 months old, and we subjected them to reduce the presentation by sulfide sequencing, uh, and, and then apply, applied machine learning approaches, particularly elastic net, to basically develop this clock. And uh, our initial clock was composed of 90 CPG sites, they are all shown here across the mouse genome. These are mouse chromosomes. And then you could see that, uh, you know, they kind of, these sites are distributed across the genome with a positive weight in the model, negative weight in the, in the model. And they could be in all kinds of different positions with no particular pattern. And then when we apply this clock to other uh, situations, it, it works pretty well. Uh, this would be a control this actual age, and this is predicted age, you can see the very good correspondence for these 16 age groups. And then we apply this to younger, younger groups, and we could see, okay, that the younger still can report the younger ages, even though they were not part of the model, or we apply the scalar restriction for uh, age groups. And you can, you can see that in each uh, uh, scalar restriction kind of age, uh, the actual, the predicted biological age is lower than chronological. Age. So this clock can report the effect of this intervention, calorie restriction. Another example is growth hormone receptor knockout. It's known to extend lifespan, and biologically, uh, the knockout mice are younger, even though chronologically they are the same as control. Uh, also, uh, we collected fibroblasts from the kidney and, and the lung of mice and converted them to induced pluripotent stem cells, and we found that the age dropped essentially to zero. So there's a complete rejuvenation of fibroblasts upon their conversion to iPS cells. And the clock, even though we developed this based on mouse blood, actually they, they also work to report the rejuvenation of fibroblasts upon the cell reprogramming. So obviously there is a, you know, a utility of the clocks, even though, again, I would stress the, the imperfect clocks, so it's still unclear what exactly they measure. So there, there are some limitations, obviously. So uh, we now applied clocks in many contexts, and I'll just show you this study because we published uh, this pretty recently, early this year. And here we try to address the question of aging of naked mole rats. As I already mentioned, uh, the naked mole rat is a very interesting organism. It's, it's the longest lived rodent. It's a very small mouse-sized animal, which lives uh, you know, almost 40 years, can live almost 40 years. And one feature of the naked mole rat is that its mortality rate does not increase with age. This was studied uh, uh, previously by the, uh, primarily by uh, the group of Dr. Buffenstein. And so they found that mortality rate really is quite stable across ages in the, in the neck moderate. So this will be in contrast to human, where the, of course the rate of uh, dying you know, exponentially increases. It doubles every eight years. There is a, there is a in that sense, Nick Moret is a really uh, very strange animal, an outlier. So then the question is, if if does not increase biological age, uh, it, if it does not increase uh, uh, mortality with age, does it even age? It's often discussed in the literature, it's non-aging mammal, which would be strange because it still has you know, neurons or you know, a skeleton. So then it's, it's unclear to me how it, can it not age if it has this non-renewable <coughs> cells? We wanted to address that. And for this, we developed a ECMO red aging clock, a epigenetic aging clock. So like in the mouse, we collected uh, blood cells, we, blood, uh, you know, isolated cells, sequenced them by reducing the presentation by sulfide sequencing, over 100 animals, and developed the clock. And the clock looks like this. Actually, it, it reports the, the increase in biological age. This is the actual age of animals, and this is the predicted age, regardless whether they are you know, workers or queen breeding, breeding males, uh, they all increase biological age with age. So what does it mean? So 
they don't show an increased mortality with age, yet they increase biological age. The, the question is, do they age? What is more important, actually, is the uh, uh, a feature that is reported by epigenetic clock or the feature that is reported by looking at mortality rate. So uh, I, I think it's, it's debatable. It's clearly, still there is no consensus on that. So in my mind, in this particular situation, epigenetic clock is better. Because even conceptually, the, the, the mammal, I, I, cannot, I, do, I would not understand how it could not age. Uh, we know it ages, actually. Uh, that uh, you know, it accumulates mutations, it accumulates epigenetic drift, uh, and then, but mortality does not increase. Anyway, so we were able to compare the rate of age aging of the NECMO rat with humans and mice. So because we, we can look at the sites with decreased methylation, clock sites, and decreased methylation for the NECMO rat compared with the mouse changes and also with the human changes, and when we put them on the same uh, time scale. From zero to 100 years, for the decreasing size, you immediately see this is mouse, this is naked more red, this is human. For the increasing size, mouse, naked more red, human. And here we put them on, this, on the relative scale, yeah, from zero to one, for the decreasing size and increasing size. You know, clearly they age in, in, a, in a similar manner, which is just with a different rate. And mouse ages fastest, naked more red in between, and human is, is the slowest in aging. And, and that's exactly what, what we think. All three organisms age, age with slightly different rate. But then mortality rate increases in the mouse, increases in the human, but does not increase in the, in the neck more red. And to me, it tells that the mortality rate is just a, an, an imperfect measure of aging. That's all. Now, I told you so far about the PGD clock that uh, apply uh, across different tissues and organisms. But all of these clocks so far, they are so-called bulk clocks. We measure, uh, we assess changes in methylation with age at particular sites. And of course, changes means uh, that a certain fraction of cells in a tissue has that particular site methylated and some other sites, you know, the same site and other cells is not methylated. So for example, when we do this by RRBS, the like sample A and sample B, uh, we sequence the genome and we can assess the kind of the fraction of particular site being methylated. And we could develop this matrix like that with sites one, two, three, four, five, CPG sites and sample ABC. And we can say, okay, this particular site uh, in sample A, 0.1 methylated. That means 10% of, of cytosines in the sample are methylated and 90% are not methylated. Yeah. And then we could use this information to build a dependence like this and, and develop the clock. But at a single cell level, it does not work. And that's really what we want to do because a cell is a unit of life. So we want to understand aging of individual cells, not really the you know, aging of the tissue. And so if we apply the same approach to single cells, we would obtain information like this. CPG sites, one, two, three, four, five, in the sample ABC. So in some cases, we would have no information because the, uh, the sequencing is very sparse in individual cells. And then uh, in other situations, it would be very binary. So basically one or zero because a particular site can be methylated or non-methylated. So if we cannot really assess fractions like this. So also when we look at the uh, overlap between uh, uh, sites, the, there is almost nothing because if you look at the one site, it could be like a million or a couple of million C, uh, you know, CPGs. Uh, like if you overlap two CPGs, it's only 100,000, three, 10,000, four, 1,000. When we overlap 20 cells, Basically, there's nothing left. So we cannot apply these standard Horvath-like approaches to assess uh, aging of individual cells. And for that, we develop a completely new uh, approach. We call it flexible and scalable probabilistic framework for epigenetic age prediction at a single cell resolution. And the program called SCH. And the paper was published uh, in December of 2021, just very recently. As far as I know, this is the first uh, tool that is able to assess um, aging of individual cells at the epigenetic level. And of course, again, so it's a, it, it's a first generation of Olga algorithm and it can be improved, but we are still very happy that uh, we, uh, we, we could develop it and apply and, and, and test various, various predictions, as I will tell you in a minute. So first, how do we develop this? 
First, we um, uh, train regression models to predict methylation level from age and bulk tissue, which means we kind of reverse the conventional relationship between age and methylation, and we predict methylation from age rather than uh, the other way around. And then we compute the likelihood of observing uh, selected methylation profile in single cells. And uh, an important point here is that in the bulk data set, uh, we would have many CPG sites, but then, uh, and we use this bulk data set for training the clock, but then in individual cells, we would have CPGs like this. Only some of them will overlap with the bulk data set. And in, in, in a cell B, some other group of CPGs would overlap. So this means that we would calculate the age of cell A based on this overlapped uh, CPG size, but predict the age of cell B based on different CPG sites. And of course, we initially were not sure if it would work. Uh, um, and so, but somehow it, it works surprisingly well, actually. So when we compute a profile, this likelihood profile, we observe patterns like this, basically this in log likelihood for one cell and for another cell, like for example, it could be young cell, old cell. And we simply uh, say that the predicted biological age of a cell is the corresponding to the maximal likelihood of, 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 on that. So now let's apply this uh, uh, clock to, to real kind of situations. First, we apply this to this data set from Jan Big's lab uh, on single cells in, in the liver, hepatocytes, from four months old mice and 26 months old mice. And when we predict the age of individual cells, actually the prediction is very accurate. Look, here is the, the actual age, and this is predicted age, and each dot is in the individual cell. And then this is for the uh, 26 month old mice, Hepatocytes, again, prediction is quite accurate. Clearly, all cells, in this case, they, uh, they aged. It's not like we have a tissue in which, you know, most cells stay, uh, you know, at the same age, but, you know, a few cells really, really dramatically age, and that's why in the, in the bulk tissue we observe aging. Actually, most cells age. Yeah, I, I think until we, uh, we address this by using a single cell clock, the, it, it was not very clear. And this is the clock based on the liver because we trained both the liver clock and the multi-tissue clock. And at the level of multi-tissue, we also observed the same thing. So we observed based on, uh, we used six different tissues to train the clock and then applied to the liver, it still works. Now uh, we wanted to test uh, other cell types. So here is the same data set. Uh, this is the young hepatocytes. These are old hepatocytes. And then we applied this our SCH clock to mouse embryonic fibroblasts. And interestingly, they observed that the age of these cells is close to zero. Uh, even though we developed a clock based on the liver, yeah, trained the clock based on the liver, actually, it also works at the level of uh, individual mouse embryonic fibroblasts. Now, uh, we wanted to test um, uh, different cell types. So here is the data set from uh, Wolf Reich's lab, and they studied muscle stem cells. And they reported previously, uh, interesting observation. They found that when they look at the aging of the muscle here, muscle does age. However, if they isolated muscle stem cells uh, in the young animals and old animals, stem cells in the old animal, muscle stem cells are still pretty young based on bulk approaches. This was very surprising. How can cells be young in the old animal? So we wanted to test it by applying our SCH approach at the single cell level. And when we apply this, we observe the same thing. Again, so it's a completely different approach. And these are individual cells, muscle stem cells in the young animal, they are young. In the old animal, I mean, they do age. I mean, we see a significant aging, but they are still relatively young. Yeah, so basically what this means this is the kind of picture emerges from, from, from these approaches. So first, many cells do age. This is the chronological age. This is predicted age based on single cell clock. So many cells do age with age. However, there are some cells that age faster, such as certain senescent cells. And there are some cells age slower, like certain stem cells. And then in the end, when we look at the tissue, the age of the tissue, I mean, it's a kind of integrated measure of individual cells, but the actual age of individual cells 
does not you know match exactly to the biological age of the tissue because there are cells with a different biological age in the tissue and of course many cells uh, would have the age of the cells quite similar uh, because they would all age but there are clear outliers as well in, in both directions some cells which are highly damaged they would be you know much older biologically and there are perhaps some certain cell stem cell populations they would be much younger so now it's time to kind of give an overview of what uh, how kind of uh, how our lab operates uh, so first we developed this longevity signatures I already told you about this longevity across cell types longevity across mammals longevity across interventions based on this we developed signatures of longevity uh, that have this pred predictive power in terms of identifying new interventions that could extend lifespan. In parallel, we work on aging signatures. We develop epigenetic clocks, single cell clocks, and also low cost clocks. We, uh, uh, there's no time but, uh, to present today, but we also develop clocks. Uh, well, one feature of the clocks is that they're still relatively expensive. So we're trying to develop uh, approaches for inexpensive assessment of biological age. We have a bioarchive paper if anybody is interested on that. Uh, and, uh, and we also uh, develop uh, what we call the rejuvenation signatures, and this is still a work in progress. So, uh, uh, and, uh, so I will not show you the data yet on that. But the point is that we integrate all of these signatures together in order to understand aging and target aging, and, and in both in the direction of aging and rejuvenation. This would result in the candidate compounds and factors we identify, we're currently testing them. I already mentioned we have this large program with many mice where we, in collaboration with Rich Miller, where we um, test various interventions for lifespan extension. Now, so far I told you about, primarily I told you about slowing down the aging process, whether it's a calorie restriction or, you know, a or growth hormone receptor in account, it kind of slows down because it's just, you know, results in slower accumulation of molecular damage over time. However, uh, what would, would be really interesting and very important, not just slow down, but perhaps reverse aging, rejuvenate organisms and cells. So in this slide, aging is represented by this vertical axis here, and we could slow it down by, by and, 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 and aging is like water flowing here. And then we could slow down by building steps like a calorie restriction or apomycin, metformin and so on. But what we want to do, we, we want to take water from here and bring it back to a younger biological age. Is it even possible? We know it's possible because uh, this is the example of induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, this Yamanaka type approaches when cells are reprogrammed uh, and they are adult cells, somatic cells, into induced pluripotent stem cells, these are embryonic cells. By definition, they, they should be younger. So I think this is a very good example of the possibility of rejuvenation. But is this the only way to rejuvenate? Apparently it's not. And the recent uh, data, and now it's just, I think really, uh, it's just an amazing uh, kind of development in the field, I, I think, which uh, together, even though we understand very little so far mechanistically, I think together makes a very strong case that aging can be reversed partially. So one example is, is this study. This is actually a study from the, from the lab of David Sinclair and we collaborated uh, with him in, in this study. And here is they, they used the optic nerve in mice, which they crashed and then overexpressed uh, three of the four Yamanaka factors. And this induced re regeneration. And we also found by applying the clock, the clocks that actually um, uh, the tissue upon uh, injury, the biological age increases, but then upon overexpression of OSK, actually uh, it, it decreases. So, uh, so this, this is, could, could be also an example of rejuvenation. Uh, a, a third example is uh, also actually very famous uh, a tool called, uh, or, or method called uh, uh, heterochronic parabiosis. Uh, in, in this case, uh, mice would be a, a young mouse, an old mouse, they would be attached, uh, uh, you know, so that they form a, a common circulatory system, circulation, so they exchange blood. And what we do, uh, we keep them uh, together for three months and then detach uh, and then follow them later, like for, for an additional, typically two months, 
uh, uh, depends on actually on depends on the study. I would point out this is a great collaboration with uh, Professor Jim White uh, from Duke University. And so what we found, uh, and the paper is under review, but also if you're interested, can, can find them in the bioarchive. So what we found actually that this way, uh, by applying heterochronic probiosis, we can extend lifespan of mice. So, so here are the mice which are young, uh, uh, connected to the young, and this is old connected to the young. Sorry, no, and vice versa. No, no, yeah, you're right. Old connected to the young. So old mice, upon uh, attachment to the young, they uh, show an extended lifespan. So, so this will be controlled when the old connected to the old, of course. So we connect them for three months and then separate them after three months. And they just follow until they die. And the mice which were attached previously to the young mice, they live longer. So, but are they biologically younger? Of course, that's the, really the key question. And so for this, we applied our clocks. And so we apply this both in the blood and in the, in the, in the, in the liver as well, and both in the mice which were attached for three months and mice which were attached for three months and then detached for another two months and then analyzed. Of course, after two months, blood is primarily exchanged. And we still see this rejuvenation effect, whether it's in the blood or in the liver, it's significant. So this means that parabiosis truly rejuvenates the animals even though we don't understand the mechanism. And of course, previously, there have been many studies that, uh, you know, the stem cells or various physiological measures in mice and so on, which kind of already hinted at that process. But here is actually quantitative assessment of biological age and parabiosis does rejuvenate mice and make them longer live. So this is, I think it's another good example of rejuvenation. And to introduce you a fourth example of rejuvenation, I want you to think about this, pro this question. When does aging begin? Uh, that question uh, is not easy to answer. And so when you ask this question, various people in the field, they would give you a different answer. So of course, the easy way to think about is just look at the mortality rate, you know, following this kind of logic. Something ages if it's more likely to fall apart tomorrow than today. And this is the basis for the majority of this uh, demographic models, evolutionary models. That's exactly how aging is followed. Uh, the Gombrich equation and everything else associated with that, various evolutionary theories, they're all based on mortality patterns. And of course, in humans, we know that mortality rate increases exp exponentially with age. This is a log scale, yeah, like this. So then intuitively, we would think, okay, if we continue this dependence to the lower uh, biological age, we could find when it actually begins. The problem is that the pattern is much more complicated than, than that. So for example, in males, between the age of 20 and 30, there is no increase in mortality rate. When we look at the younger ages, we see that the, the children, when they are born, the mortality rate is actually quite high. And then it sharply decreases. And uh, mean, it's, it's a minimum at the age of nine. So if we apply this mortality kind of ideas, then we, we, we would say that the newborn children, they are older, perhaps corresponding to maybe 60 year old uh, person, and then they, they would be rejuvenated during, uh, during childhood, which of course just makes no sense. Yeah? So this already indicates that mortality is really a, a not, not very good. Mm, I mean, it, it's very good. <laughs> it, it's very good in the late, later life, but uh, you know, it's also imperfect representation of the aging process. And Nick Moret example is just another example of that. <clears throat> so now, if I ask when does aging begin, I get all these kind of different answers. Some people think, okay, when the phenotypes of aging emerge, like 40 years old. Some people say, well, it, because aging is continuation of development, it's a, after completion of development, maybe age 20. And somebody says, no, it must be at the age of puberty because uh, strength of natural selection initially is high, and then once the person reaches reproductive age, strength of natural selection begins to decrease. That's really the aging. Yeah? And then they would say uh, puberty uh, age 13. And then somebody says, no, it must be minimal mortality. Because if you look at mortality, it must be the minimal at the beginning of aging. That's age nine. And some people say it was birth or conception, minus 0.75 years. So when is it? It's 
you know, it really, again, brings us back to the very definition of aging. To try to understand what aging is and how, depends on how we define it, then could, we could define the beginning of aging. So I told you that we are thinking in the lab in terms of the damage. So we wanted to assess how does damage change with age? When does damage begin to increase actually in the organisms? And so for that, we apply various approaches. So for example, we can quantify mutation accumulation or quantify epigenetic changes various other ways. And when we look at the damage, we never see a pattern like this, like U-shaped curve, like here. We never see it. We always see that the damage is lowest in the youngest biological, youngest chronological age and increases with age, like here, like this, like this, like this, epigenetically the same here in the mouse of human, doesn't matter. So we published it here in this paper. But Still, the question is, when exactly does it begin? It, it begins earlier. So we think that aging begins early, perhaps before a person is born. But when? And to address that question, we need to consider uh, kind of the ideas of August Weismann. Back in the 19th century, he conceived this kind of very clear idea of separation of ageless germline and aging so on. Of course, germline goes from generation to generation, and therefore, you know, it cannot really age. Whereas soma is something which is, you know, only in one organism and then it dies. Yeah? And therefore, you can literally find statements like this in thousands of papers. Germline does not age. And of course, it makes sense because if it would age, then the, in the next generation, germline would be at a higher biological age. In the following, even higher, 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 and the population would be extinct. Obviously, organisms need to begin development with a, you know, the same low biological age. But how can it be possible? Because germline accumulates damage. These are live cells. They would produce mutations, epimutations. They would modify proteins, produce byproducts. So they must age, but they do not. So for new life to begin in the same young state, biological age must somehow be decreased. So our hypothesis is this, germline actually ages during development in adult life and is rejuvenated in the offspring after conception. So the model we predict is like this. This was published about a year ago as a, as a, as a model. Uh, we think that the that biological age of the zygote, which is a fertilized egg, is not zero because it comes from the biological age of the germline. Yeah, and you know the sperm aged and, and the oocytes aged, and now we have a zygote. Biological age is not zero, but then it would need to decrease to a point which we call a ground zero point, which would represent the lowest biological age. And then we think this is the point where aging begins, and also organismal life begins. I think this is a very very important point in life, maybe the most important. And we also think, although we don't have evidence yet, that this point also corresponds to so-called phylotypic state of the organism. This is the, a part of the evolutionary hourglass model. And the model you know, basically describes a very striking observation. For example, if you look at the vertebrates at the level of, of the um, gametes and, and the zygotes and maybe early embryos, they're all very different. You can easily distinguish like a chicken egg like from a mouse egg. Yeah, anybody can distinguish chicken egg from a mouse egg. But then during development, all vertebrates, they form a very similar morphological state called phylotypic state. You know, you have to be an expert actually to distinguish mouse from a chicken at that point. And, and then they would develop further and they would become different again. And at that point, at that point is also characterized by the expression of the evolutionary oldest genes and the very low, the minimal, the lowest uh, variance in gene expression. So there's something very specific about this point. And again, so we don't have evidence, but we think it's related to the ground zero point. So we wanted to test this prediction of this model. So first, we want to ask a question, whether it's even possible to obtain the biological age of zero. And I think uh, it's not possible 
because damage is always present in the organism. And one example of that is genomic damage. So this is a paper we published a couple of years ago where we studied uh, the effect of uh, damaging mutations on lifespan. And so we find, we analyze various uh, databases like UK Biobank, for example, for, for this um, uh, you know, alleles, uh, SNPs with various frequency. And uh, for the ultra rare variants here, we see a strong association of protein truncating variants with the decreased lifespan. So these variants are clearly damaging. Typically, they are um, like one copy or both copies of very important genes are completely disrupted. And we find, if you look at the population, we find approximately seven such mutation, mutations on average in, in each person, highly damaging mutations. Sometimes people like it to have like zero, maybe one or two mutations. Some people have more than 10 such mutations. And if you've been like this and analyze specifically people with the highest number of such mutation in the lowest number of such mutation and looking for survival, there's a clear difference. Uh, people with the lowest uh, number of such mutations, they are much longer lived, even if you just follow them for 10 years. And we observe this in, in this data set in the UK Biobank for the lifespan, for the health span, the same, even for the mother's age of death, because you know parents contribute 50% of the age, you know. Uh, to, the, or to the offspring. So, but the point is, you know, the damage is always there, at least the genomic damage. The second prediction from this model is that we want to assess cells at this stage of life. And the prediction would, would be that at least under, you know, ideal growth conditions, they would not age. And maybe in some way, and sometimes they might be even rejuvenated. And so we tested this by applying, uh, the, by assessing embryonic stem cells and iPS cells. Of course, embryonic stem cells, they correspond approximately to the blastocyst stage and IPS as well. And so when we analyze biological age of embryonic stem cells, you see this is a passage number from zero to over 100. And look at the age, this is zero. The majority of uh, samples are below age of zero, even after 100 passages. If you passage like fibroblasts or many other cells, they would clearly age, but embryonic stem cells do not. They are on that side of the U-shaped curve in terms of the biological age. The same thing for, for IPS cells. Uh, even after like 40 passages, you can barely see any increase. I mean, there is a sl slight increase, but it's still very low, like below age. And of course, it's a cells in culture. This is not an ideal condition to, 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 to grow these cells. And then we wanted to directly test this idea and uh, quantify biological age across the development in mice. And you can see that this is, would be the zygote here, and then uh, two cell, four cell embryo, the blastocyst and so on, an implanted embryo. And we see a decrease in biological age when applying the clock. This is our ground zero. We actually don't know exactly when this point is. We're still trying to find out. Uh, but it's approximately here. Yeah, around the age, maybe six to eight days. Uh, and then the biological age increases. So, of course, these are bulk clocks, yeah? We want also to apply our single cell clock, which is a completely different approach. And here is, we take this mouse data set from the Goldbrex lab and apply our SCH approach. Embryonic day 4.5, 5.5, 6.5, 7.5 in mice. And we see a clear decrease in biological age, rejuvenation of cells during development. One can say, well, it's obvious because during development, we remodel the methylome. Yeah, demethylation is decreased. You know, it's stripped and then remethylated. And therefore, lowest methylation would correspond to the lowest biological age. Why not? But this is not what we observe. We actually find that in between embryonic day 4.5 and 7.5, methylation increases. So the lowest epigenetic age really corresponds to the highest methylation, not vice versa. So for the, at least for the embryonic rejuvenation, in order to achieve rejuvenation, we need first to demethylate the genome and then remethylate it. Another point is that we need to understand how exactly this happens. Is it like during development, all cells are rejuvenated or maybe a particular cell population is rejuvenated? And because we have single cell data, we can address that and using our clocks. So first, we find that when we uh, uh, 
quantify this uh, from 4.5 to 7.5 days in development in epiblast only, we clearly see rejuvenation. And when we look at uh, the primitive cheek, endoderm, mesoderm, ectoderm, they're all rejuvenated. However, if we analyze visceral endoderm and extra embryonic ectoderm, which are extra embryonic tissues, the age is not zero, it's higher than zero. The cells are not rejuvenated, at least not fully rejuvenated. So apparently there are some mechanisms which allow rejuvenation of some cells during development. And these cells which become the embryo itself, but the extra embryonic tissues, while being young, relatively young, they are not fully rejuvenated. So somehow there is a mechanism. We're still trying to understand mechanisms because it's so interesting. And in general, it's kind of appealing to understand it because if we understand mechanistically how it happens, perhaps we could apply this to somatic cells, induce the same processes and uh, allow you know, rejuvenation of, of cells. And this is our current model in, of embryonic rejuvenation. When the zygote is formed, the biological age is not zero. And during development, uh, there is a decrease, a particular sharp decrease at this stage. It corresponds approximately to the stage of gastrulation. And then this would mark the beginning of aging and also mark the beginning of organismal life. And then aging would begin here. This is a very, very important point in life. I think the most important. So, and if what I told you is correct, uh, I think it provides some insights into the nature uh, together, what I presented provides some insights into the nature of aging and, and also other important processes like development and rejuvenation. So what I think aging is, it's the accumulation of damage that increases biological age. It's not an increased mortality. It's not a uh, loss of function even, uh, not just age-related changes, but it's the accumulation of negative age-related consequence of being alive, such as molecular damage. It begins at ground zero during embryonic development and ends when organism dies. And it has no purpose. There's no benefit in aging. It's not also programmed, but it is quasi-programmed because the life itself is programmed. So aging is also quite different from development. Aging is not a con con continuation of development. Aging development, they go in parallel. I would say aging is a consequence of development. We can say that. What is development? It's a genetic program. Its purpose to build a fit organism. It begins at conception and ends when development is completed, maybe around 20 years old in humans, approximately. Then it, rejuvenation would, would mean that it's a damage clearance that decreases biological age. And a natural, we discovered this natural rejuvenation event that begins at conception and ends at ground zero during early, early development. Then the question is whether Weizmann's ideas of immortal germline and aging soma are correct. Of course, the ideas of germline and, and, and soma are correct. But I think it's not 100% correct because now we clearly find that actually both soma and germline can age and both can be rejuvenated. And if we understand how exactly this rejuvenation happens, whether the four examples of rejuvenation that I presented have any similarity mechanistically, if it's the same process or different process, maybe there are various ways to rejuvenate organism. I, I mean, it might potentially, uh, hypothetically, of course, at the moment, uh, provide um, you know, tools for radical lifespan extension, not something that is achieved by simple longevity interventions like calorie restriction. Of course, this is uh, largely still unclear, but just very exciting just because uh, you know, these opportunities, I think it just uh, uh, can be a focus for future studies. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge people have been involved. Uh, this is my current lab, and uh, also many former labs con lab members contributed. Uh, I think uh, I primarily told you about the studies done by Anastasia, Alex, um, Alex, and, and Bohan here, um, and uh, also Alex Trapp and, and Chaba and, and Daniel, I think. So I think those are the main uh, contributors to what I presented to you today. Uh, but other lab members currently former uh, contributed as well in various ways. And we also have many collaborators 
on various aspects of the study. For example, many uh, interventions uh, in my SP study with uh, Rich Miller, probably with Jim White on the machine clocks, we collaborate with Steve Horvath and Morgan Levine. I told you collaboration with David Sinclair. There is a, we have a program project grant on comparative genomics of longevity headed by Vera Kromanova with Andre and uh, Jan contributing as well as Nick Shork. So um, they all contributed in various ways. And this is the uh, lab at the retreat last fall. And of course, I'm very grateful also uh, for funding uh, funding that, that we received from NIA uh, over the years, particularly as Pioneer and Transformative Awards. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. This was, to me, a, a really mesmerizing and fun conceptual tour to the force um, across the uh, spectrum of aging. And I'm going to use the prerogative of the coordinator um, to ask one question, and then I'm gonna call on the questions that are in the chat. Um, and my question actually goes back to your very first point. Um, and you said that genetics is the main feature that defines aging. But on the other hand, you also said that the aging is basically the result of the failure of all the protective machineries, if I got you right. You said every, every cellular function can contribute to, to, to the damage associated with aging. So it seems that you're focusing almost, to my mind, almost exclusively on the genetic aspect and you take your evidence to support the genetic aspect based on phenotypic changes. Um, what about all these other protective machineries? And why don't you look at them? Or do you look at them? Yes. So that's a very good question. So first, I, I want to clarify. I think maybe it wasn't very clear when I presented uh, uh, what I meant by, by the role of genetics. So I sometimes give this example. So uh, let's, let's take a, like a fly, a, a mouse, and a human put them in the same room, give them the same air to breathe, the same food to eat, you know, you know, everything is the same for them. Yeah, the environment is the same, but they would have widely different lifespans. Yeah, so at the level of species, environment contributes very little to lifespan. So in general, like the primary determinant of lifespan is genetics, not environment and not stochastics also. But then within species, of course, the level, you know, it's already known that genetic contributes maybe, I don't know, 20%. Those studies from twin studies, for example, it's known. Then the environment and kind of stochastic factors, they play a much more important role. So, but if you look at the, like at the, at the essence of aging, or I would say essence, essence of lifespan regulation, it's primarily genetic in my mind. Uh, and genetic, of course, for us is not just a, uh, it's an important uh, element and it's also just an important tool because the genome is large. If we do, uh, we analyze epigenetic changes, we analyze millions of CPG sites at, at a given time. If you do transcriptome, we analyze, you know, 20,000 genes. Uh, if you, for example, look at the damage. So uh, we have a study where we analyze this transcriptomic damage. Uh, again, so it's just a, it's a very convenient way to analyze damage. That's why we use uh, you know, this genetic omic, omic approaches. But we also, I just haven't presented, but we also do analyze metabolome. For example, we have many published many studies on metabolomics, mm -hmm. uh, as well as I, I think I mentioned this ionome study, uh, for example, uh, mm -hmm. studies like that. So we do apply other omics approaches, but the important point is that if we measure just individual parameters, like, you know, telomere length, for example, oxidative damage, in my mind, it's just not very useful. It's just in order to understand aging, we need you know, more systemic view more with many, many parameters. That's why we, we apply this multiple omics approaches. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I, I'd love to uh, have several beers uh, after this talk with you to keep the conversation going, but let me be fair to the other people. So Victoria Malloy um, has su submitted several questions and um, Let's start with one of them. It says, what happened to the younger mice? I think this happens to, has to do with the parabiosis experiments. What happened to the younger mice that um, the older, older mice were attached to? 
Yeah, so maybe you uh, could ask the question too. Probably. Yeah, yeah, I understand the question very well. Reverse as well. I understand, understand the question, but it's a very interesting question. So uh, we have a, a biochemical paper on what happens to the old mice because rejuvenation actually is the most important in in this context. But uh, but she's right that uh, actually also an important point what happens to the younger mice. So uh, we have a, like, also manuscript uh, kind of in, in progress on that. And uh, well, I can say that they, they do age. <laughs> you know, let's put it this way for now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, her prior question, let's see, is that uh, she said, could, could the degradation be part of the master plan? Are living things pre-programmed to live and then to cease? And I think your answer to that is probably yes, but go ahead. Well, uh, if the idea is like the organism pre-programmed to live and die, uh, you know, I, I think aging, my thinking aging is not programmed. So we program, uh, there's a program like development program, uh, you know, it's a clearly a, a program, but then there's no purpose in my mind in, in aging. It just happens as an unavoidable consequence of having a, a, a program. I don't know if I understand the question correctly, but to me, aging is not programmed. So th there is no program to die. It just happens. Thank you. Now, Paula Sebastiani asks, she says, thank you for all this useful information. Are the signatures of longevity available? And did you generate longevity signatures using proteomic, metabolomic, and microbiome data? Are there some common themes? Yes. So, so yeah, we published the cell, uh, cell metabolism paper on the metabolomic signatures of longevity as well. We haven't done proteomic, uh, but uh, uh, Paula is... Um... Sorry, we lost you. I, I didn't put Paula here, but actually we also collaborate with Paula and you can see her here as well. We're very excited to give you a talk. By the way, there is a, there is a conference at uh, the Systems Biology Con Board and Research Conference, completely new conference that oh. uh, will, will, be, will take place next month. So we'll cover many of the topics I discussed today. Uh, but, and of course, uh, Ms. Paula, she is, she's the PI of this uh, UH2, UH3 project. We are part of that project as well, uh, where we uh, uh, hopefully will contribute to the protome as well. Okay. Um, and uh, from Kasravan Ezilan, similar to cancer, is there loss of connection or interaction between cells and aging? Cells in age, excuse me. Could, could you repeat again the question? Uh, similar to cancer, is there loss of connection or interaction between cells in aging? And I'm Even sorry, aging, I, uh, loss of loss of interaction uh, between cells. Well, yes, between cells in aging. In other words, I I'm I'm now trying to interpret the question myself. Um, you know, uh, in cancer, you have this prolific growth, right? Which is different from what you usually see in normal development, I presume. And then there's also cancer cells seem not to age out, whereas normal cells age out, if you can be that simplistic. So can you make the distinction? Explain why one may go one, one may go the other. Yeah, cancer is a, is a complicated case uh, somehow. Uh... If we analyze cancer in the, in the bulk state, uh, there's all kinds of different cells, dying cells, rejuvenated cells, like uh, rapidly evolving cells. It's a, a huge heterogeneity actually within the tissue. And uh, I think uh, I, it's, not, it's not fully resolved. So when we apply the clocks, we sometimes see that cancers are younger actually. Sometimes they are older than the tissue. And um, sometimes they, they actually do age. And sometimes they do not. So I, I think there's more research needs to be done in, in this area in terms of the biological age of, of cancer. Okay, thank you. And uh, Monty Montano asks, are, are there classes of CPG sites that reflect aging acceleration in response to specific stressors that can be distinguished from stressor independent clots? Yeah, it's a very good question as well. So. Uh, I think uh, maybe I would put it in, in, a, in an even broader question. So whether sites that are used in the clocks are causal and which of these sites kind of represent aging versus representing, you know, stress or consequence of stress or consequence of aging. 
And, and that's uh, another unresolved question. We're currently uh, trying to address that question in, in the lab, trying to understand who, which of these CPG sites represent agent per se, and which sites correspond to, you know, just kind of random changes, neutral changes just happen with age, and which sites correspond to changes which are, in a way, uh, adaptive or protective, kind of, uh, in a way, a response to, a response to stress or to age, aging. And uh, currently, uh, it's not easy basically to do, but there are some ideas how to do it. And I think we're currently trying to do it and other labs are trying to do it as well. Great, thank you. So now I'd like to go back to an example that you gave with David Sinclair's rejuvenation of the optic nerve. And people use it as an example of, of really reversing aging. But to my mind, that actually, I wonder if that's a differential, a different interpretation. It seems like he is restoring function by recreating, rejuvenate, or rebuilding the nerve. But that's very different from reversing aging. Uh, at least it seems to me. And I would, and I wonder if we're having a semantic discussion, or is there really a functional discussion? Do you understand my question? Yeah, I understand. I think David would be the best to answer this question because. We really contributed in some way, but uh, not really intimately involved in that study. Uh, I primarily use it as an example. Uh, yeah, so I, I would say it's, it's still not fully resolved. So okay. in general, the relationship between regeneration and rejuvenation is also uh, kind of unclear because in this case, yes, you know, clearly we, we induce re regeneration by expressing OSK factors. Mm -hmm. So based on the clocks, though, um, we see a decreased biological age in response to rescuing that injury uh, by expressing these factors. Okay, what does it mean exactly in terms of biological age? I think still not fully resolved. Okay, thank you. Um, are people submitting more questions? Because I just hope I'm not screwing up electronically here. Um, no, I think I'm up to date. Um, so I'm gonna ask one other question and this has to do with the mortality rate. Um, did you comment about how your clocks do or don't predict mortality rate and why they do or don't predict mortality rate? Uh, because we primarily work on, uh, in the mouse model, uh, we don't have such clocks yet. Uh, we are we're trying to we're kind of working towards them, but we don't have, uh, I, I would refer to the human situation when uh, Steve Horvath has this green age clock, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, which I think is the best human clock in terms of predicting uh, mortality currently. Mm -hmm. It's heavily based on cardiovascular uh, uh, these models, which is the primary risk factor, because or the cause of primary cause of death in humans. So, but in mice, as far as I know, uh, nobody has developed yet uh, a similar clock. Okay, um, let me just see if I've done due, due diligence here, electronic due diligence. Um, well, I think I've uh, covered most of the questions. So we're running a little bit late. So I'm gonna thank you so much. I think it was a fabulous talk and certainly we'll be asking you to come again to the Biology of Aging course. Um, I think it's an enchanting introduction and overview of the field. So thanks a million, buddy. Okay, thank you again for the invitation. Yeah, it's, it's great. Uh, you had a loyal, you had a loyal following. Okay, <laughs> okay bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.